Um, but I'm also here as a mum to two um, children with SEN who also have constipation issues. Thank you. And also here from Oxfordson is Angela Wade, who is hopefully going to be monitoring the chat for us. She's she doesn't know that. I've just been informed that that's what she's going to do because that's how we roll. Um, if you're happy with that, Angela, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello everybody, I'm Anjali. It, it seems like my new job is to be monitoring the chat, so I shall be doing that today. Um, I've got uh, three children and my youngest, Theo, um, <clears throat> is, uh, yeah, no, we don't have problems with bowels, actually. We have quite the opposite problem in our house, uh, where uh, Theo does poos the size of um, the Amazon, and uh, we spend quite a lot of time with bamboo sticks trying to shift things along. So uh, I, uh, that's probably too much information, but um, uh, I, uh, yeah, so, um, but it is a huge, uh, a huge issue. So look forward to hearing. Thanks, Angela. So that start as we mean to go on talking about poo. That's great. Thank you. I can always rely on my team to come straight to the point, which is brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, Simon, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Yes, yeah, so I'm Simon Jones. I'm a learning disability nurse consultant working for Oxford Health, and I've got uh, several of my colleagues here, um, two of whom are, I, I know are um, probably much more knowledgeable than I am. Um, so that's uh, Tracy. Do you want to say hello, Tracy? Tracy Scott. Hello. Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm a nurse with the city team. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm. I've been. Um, my nickname with a couple of people that I support is Poo Police. So because <laughs> our conversations usually open with, "Have you had a poo?" Um, it, it's something that I feel very strongly about. It's something that is so important and yeah personal experience with f children as well so yes thanks tracy and then also karen potts um good morning everyone so um i'm a community learning disability nurse and i'm normally or pre-covid i was based over in abingdon although we're currently home based at the moment as you can tell from the mess behind me <laughs> And then I think we've got Charlotte and Lorraine on the call as well, and also uh, and there's Rachel's uh, there as well. So Rachel, do you want to just say who who you are? Hi, oh, yeah, I'm Rachel Miller. I'm patient experience and involvement lead for learning disabilities within Oxford Health, and that role also includes um, involving carers in various service improvement projects um, and listening to see what we can learn from people's experiences. Okay, Gail, so I think that, that's the Oxford Health contingent. Lovely, thanks for that, Simon. And um, we've also got um, Stephanie Ross, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Steph. Yeah, hi, so um, I work alongside the community learning disability nurses, so I'm one of the learning disability liaison nurses with the Hospital Trust, with AUH. So lovely okay. to join you all, thank you. And thanks for all joining us today, it's really appreciated, as, as we say all the time at these events, just for you to give up your time, we know how busy you are, so... Um, Thank you very much. Are we, are we missing any professionals that don't belong to Oxford Health or OUH? Just shout out at me, otherwise we'll make a start. Thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, so we're gonna start with a little bit of a presentation. I'll, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the background to why we want to do this event. But to start with, what we think would be really helpful is to get a bit of a poll going so we can find out how many, what your situation is, um, a kind of entry poll. What, what do we call it? Cassie, I can't remember what we call this poll, but anyway, I'm gonna try and launch it now. Bear with me, I'm new to polls. Uh, okay, so launch this one. And if you could just, there's only a couple of questions. If you could just fill that in for us, that'd be great. Has everyone got that? We do still have somebody on a, a, an iPhone, P30 Lite. We're not quite sure who you are. I've got Lorraine Bowler, so I know that's not Lorraine. It's a different phone. So if there's somebody on there who's coming on a phone, it'd be great if we could just find out who you are. Okay. 
Okay. So it's great. So we can instantly see who's at, who's in the room really and what their situation is for, for a brief overview, which is which is really helpful for when we start the discussions. Hello, Gail and Kathy. Um, so it's Lisa, learning disability nurse on the phone. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Your name's been changed. Appreciate it. Thank you. So has everyone done that? It says 72% have voted, but I don't know whether that's just because some isn't applicable for their professionals. So don't know. Give it another few seconds. I think that's probably it, Cathy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that, everyone. Screenshot. Lovely. Okay. So, I can't get rid of that. Cathy, if you can share the screen. So, so what we're going to do now is to do a little bit of an introduction. So, so as I said at the beginning, for me, this is something that is really close to my heart, and is something that um, that 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 I my son Guy has been struggling with. Uh, in fact, when we were planning this event, there was. Um, there was a phone call from one of his members of staff saying that they were a bit worried about him. So, but it is something um, that's always concerned me, mainly since he's been in supported living. He never had problems as a child so much. Um, and then I heard the story way back um, in 2000 and, well, actually this happened in 2012, but the story didn't come out until about 2017. And this was of Richard Handley. Um, and so if you can move it on, Cathy, to thank you. Um, can you put it on full screen? Is that I'm trying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not um it doesn't seem to want to work to that, but anyway, there we go. Okay. So uh, so we've we go on to view, Cathy. Oh, thank you. It's the top one at the on the at the yeah. end. Uh, reading view. Yeah, there we go. Is that better? No, it doesn't make any difference. It's fine. Leave it. Can everyone see the screen as long as that's fine? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so this is Richard's story, and I, I, um, I had the pleasure of speaking to Sheila Handley, Richard's mum, um, at the beginning of the year. Um, we had a conversation that we've recorded, um, that will be on our YouTube channel once I've kind of tidied it up a little bit, um. Sheila very kindly told us told us the story, and, and I think she's really she's really keen. In fact, the, the quote at the bottom says very clearly that it's been her aim since Richard died um, to do as much as she can to stop other families being in the situation hers was. Um, it didn't need to happen. It was an avoidable death, um, and things were simply could just think, things could have done to have prevented it. Um, and so we've dedicated this event to Richard. He was 33 years old, he had Down syndrome. Um, so I'm gonna tell you the story and go through it. It's quite detailed, so, so bear with me. And then, and then what we'll do is we'll look at um, some questions, what we can do to address um, some of the issues that are raised through this story. And the reason I'm telling the whole story is there's lots of issues as to why it's not simply just that Richard had, had constipation. There was lots of other things that led to that not being picked up early enough that so really need addressing. Um, so Kathy, I'm gonna do a Chris Whitty now and say, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> Can you move me on? Again? Okay. No, I'm not, I'm, it hasn't moved. Oh, it's moving on mine. That's what I don't understand. You need to go to, you need to, it needs to be on slideshow. If you go to slideshow at the top, See there, where it says slideshow, on your banner at the top. If you go to slideshow and then go from beginning. Is it showing on your screen? It's still on Richard's story. Sorry, everyone. It's, it's moving on mine. That's what I'm not understanding. I think it's because you're not on slideshow. Like, I'll, I'll stop. you stop sharing and I'll share my screen. Hang on. There we go. 
Is that no? no? If you stop sharing, I'll share my screen. It's fine. Okay, sorry. Best laid plans and all that. Okay. No, no. Bear with us. Okay. Can everyone see that? So there's Richard. Um, these are some photographs of Richard that we took from screenshots of her video. And I think we were going to try and play the video, weren't we, Cassie? Did you, did you want to do that? Can you do no. that? Are we just messing this up a bit more? Let's just leave the video. It's too technical. Okay. So these are some pictures just to show, you know, the life that, that, that Richard had um, with his sisters and the, the just important to share that. So I'm going to give you some more details. So this is this is Richard was born in 1979. Um, Down syndrome was very quickly confirmed after his birth. He spent um, 10 days in hospital because he had a problem with his bowels. So he, Richard had bowel problem right from birth. Um, and her Sprung's disease was something that was uh, mooted. Um, they they thought that's probably what was causing it right from birth. Um, and that's where a small section of the bowel wall doesn't have nerve supply, so feces don't move along properly. And they said surgery might be an option, but maybe not at that time. There was no talk of confirmatory tests at that, that operation uh, or operations to rectify things in the early days. And Sheila asked, was that an example of a her early health inequality? Was that something that would have been done for somebody who didn't have Down syndrome? When he started on solid foods, the constipation began. Um, he needed daily laxatives and a high fiber diet. So growing older, um, his bedtime routine, as parents quite often do, we have play these games, make a game out of it, threw toys up in the air while he was, um, while he was on the toilet. But Sheila talked about having one of those little sit stools, you know, that toddlers use to reach the sink, sitting on that in front of him. Even his sisters talked about it was part of their bedtime routine. Um, it, they devised an effective way of managing his constipation, making reasonable adjustments um, to keep him safe. Raised concerns with the gastroenterologist um, a couple of times um, and were advised and were managing it pretty well. So we're told that it probably surgery wasn't needed, but it was still suspected. Things were on an evil keel until he got to about 18 and then Richard's behaviour changed. He began to uh, be, become aggressive, lash out, he hit his, hit his mum, um, attacked his dad, um, shouted, she shouted to his, uh, his sister to call the police. The police were called um, and he was taken into hospital um, by ambulance and police. Um, he was given medication at that point to calm him down. This was totally out of character for Richard, um, Sheila told me. This was not his usual behaviour. Um, antipsychotics were prescribed along with antidepressants and a referral was made to the mental health team and psychiatrists. The family talk about stumbling on for the next six months. His behaviour became harder to manage um, and none of the professionals had witnessed some of the behaviour uh, but nothing had been done at that time to check for any physical cause of a changed behaviour. And I'm highlighting some of those issues through this chat as the things that we might want to discuss um, a bit later on. So they're not being checked, no physical um, issue had been um, seen as a cause for any mental health issues. It became too much for the family. Um, things became very difficult. Uh, I think the family were still feeling they weren't being listened to. They felt like they'd lost Richard. Um, nothing could have been further from the truth. She said about things being uh, exaggerated. Professional felt she was exaggerating. Um, and she just felt she wasn't being listened to. Um, so Richard was becoming much more violent. So the family advice um, was ignored about his care. So during the first four months of respite care, Richard needed manual evacuations twice because of fecal impaction. Variant, variant enemas suggested. Her sprungs again, biopsy was planned. 
His diet had deteriorated by that point. The evening games had stopped. Family advice about care was ignored, so Richard was suffering. He moved to a hospital for observations and assessment, and a psychiatrist cancelled the biopsy, saying it might be detrimental to his mental health. And psychiatry made a major decision about Richard's physical health. Could this happen today, Sheila asks, or would it be a multidisciplinary best interest decision? This is in 2011, 12, or possibly a bit before. Um, yeah, this is much earlier than that. So, so would the, uh, the Mental Capacity Act, would all of those things change things? And that's the questions we need to be asking, really. A report detailed all Richard's care, included everything to manage his constipation and it kept to keep him safe. And it made the link between constipation and his mental health. So the link had then been made. A residential care place was uh, close to their home was commissioned and the family were really pleased they were finally getting the help they needed. And Richard received excellent support at the time before the move. Manager and key worker were both really fantastic, worked with them and the hospital to ensure they had every detail about how best to support Richard. Um, Sheila talks about this being a great example of NHS and care providers working together in partnership with the family. And for years, things were absolutely fine. Richard received excellent care. Changes in medication kept him on a fairly even keel. The weekly diet sheet was displayed. Um, bowel charts were kept. Manual evacu evacuations were never needed. And the care plan was closely followed. It kept Richard, Richard safe. Sheila says she never imagined that all this knowledge would be lost, but it was. So how did it change? So in 2010, the care home changed to supported living. And at a meeting to sign a tenancy agreement, um, Sheila raised doubts about Richard's capacity to understand the contract. Um, she was assured that he would understand because they'd worked with him, let him sign because it was required um, in order to stay. After he died, Sheila discovered that the logbook of work done clearly showed that they had no understanding about the Mental Capacity Act. Um, have we got better at that? Is the question that again we need to be asking. Sheila noticed that Richard was putting on weight. A carer told her that he was being allowed to make bad decisions about his food. His diet was poor. Senior staff said Richard had the right to make unwise choices, just like everyone else. Sheila talks about him uh, it being okay. Staff saying to her, it's fine if he wants to get up at two o'clock in the morning and help himself to sausage rolls, six of them. That's fine. It's his choice, was what she was told. Um, alarm bells were ringing, obviously, for the family. He didn't have the capacity to understand the negative effects of unhealthy eating um, and suggested, as she suggested, that he'd only be given healthy options, um, but she was um, reassured by the staff team that that was going to happen. Um, Richard was allowed to make unwise choices because uh, according to the supported living provider, he had the right to do that. He quickly learned he could refuse to get up in the morning, he could refuse to have a glass, clean his teeth, cut his toenails, eat fruit and veg, and more importantly, be supervised when pooing. So Richard was left to go to the toilet on his own with no supervision, nobody monitoring um, his pains. And this new re regime created real health problems. Okay. They discovered that, uh, they realized that carers had bought him shoes because his shoes were far too big. To, this was for the room for the nails to grow, which had called right under his toes. So there's lots of alarm bells ringing about the staff really struggling to give good care. Um, family hearing about things, but feeling feeling kind of helpless to do something about. So improved communication between the care provider and other agency, that absolutely is needed. Um, and that, that's, that's been highlighted again in this. Um, previously, staff had expected Richard to do things, helping him when necessary, just when he lived at home, like he lived at home. He now had control and it was completely unsafe. Clearly a poor application of the Mental Capacity Act. Um, after Richard's death, uh, Sheila discovered that the care, uh, care changed to supported living. There was a mass clear out of paperwork, including details of so-called non-negotiable aspects of care, such as the need for a high fiber diet and monitoring of his bowel function. It's, it's a 
I, I, I need to stress, this isn't an Oxfordshire family, I need to stress. This is a family in another, oh, but could this happen anywhere? Um, and it has happened in lots of places. So at the inquest, it took, it took five years for the family to get an inquest and, and all this information has come since then. At the inquest, the carer said that Richard was refusing meals and they were glad just that he would eat anything. Looking at the daily um, diet, um, he deteriorated long before he was refusing any meals. After his death in 2012, um, Sheila learned that the bowel charts, charts had stopped in 2009, replaced by haphazard, not very informative comments in the diary. Richard was ordering staff out of the bathroom when he was pooing, um, so making monitoring difficult. Um, they didn't seek, the staff didn't seek any help or guidance dealing with it, so nobody knew that this was going on in the home. Best interest decision was considered Richard didn't have the capacity to understand why monitoring was necessary, but it was allowed to refuse on these grounds that he should be allowed privacy. Major changes to care were made with no reference to family or health. Uh, new care plan, nothing was, nothing was documented. Raising the changes would have rang alarm bells um, for, the, for, for the family and they could have worked with the staff team. Um, to, to, to improve this, to improve his health outcomes. Nearly finished, sorry, I, I realise this is long, but I just think it's really important to tell the whole story. During 2012, the psychiatrist sent three GP letters. They detailed changes in Richard's behaviour and asked the GP to continue physical management, but there was no G, GP appointment between February the 11th, 11 and October 2012. The system of annual health checks wasn't working. Nobody was monitoring, coordinating Richard's care. Should carers have been ensuring that health checks happen? From Easter 12, 2012, Richard's mental health deteriorated. He'd been fairly okay for years and he just disappeared. Uh, it did, uh, she didn't know the uh, comprehensive care plan that had kept him safe had now been downgraded. Despite the known link between mental health and constipation, Neither the GP nor the psychiatrist considered the possibility of a physical cause and didn't explore this with carers. It was viewed through the lens of mental health. Would closer co collaboration have saved Richard's life? On Monday, the 12th of November, uh, this started an unforgettable heroin week. Psychiatrists advised a move to an assessment and treatment unit to assess Richard's mental health. He also expressed concern about the distension and hardness of Richard's abdomen. He advised an emergency GP appointment. Uh, he didn't contact the GP, but left it to the carers to do. Richard wasn't seen until the Tuesday. Fecal impaction was diagnosed by a trainee GP. The normal treatment of eight sachets of Mervacol in 24 hours was prescribed. He didn't consider that it was in this state despite daily laxatives um, and didn't know her sponsor was suspected, so she didn't escalate the treatment. On the Wednesday, Richard was moved to an assessment and treatment unit. The psychiatric nurse was so dismayed by Richard's abdomen, he immediately took him to a &E and Richard was admitted to hospital. His passport, which should have had all the key information about him, had been written solely by his carers and said he was mostly independent. There was nothing in there about his uh, constipation, um, a vital element of his care needs. Um, the learning disability liaison nurse had been on site um, and uh, they'd had a horrific time with uh, an anaesthetic um, and fear because he had a fear of needles. Um, could the carers uh, liaise with the learning disability nurses producing more useful documents? Um, we need to look, we'll ask those questions as well. Is that or is that happening now here? Um, the procedure involved the removal of 10 kilograms of feces, but Richard's abdomen remained huge. Projectile, projectile vomiting of dark brown liquid didn't trigger further investigations. It was just assumed that normal pathway of fluids and laxatives would clear things and he would be discharged. During the Friday, he had breathing difficulties to put on oxygen. And Sheila learned from the records that despite his early warning score going up several times, Senior staff weren't called, so he didn't benefit from the greater experience. No action was taken until 10 p.m. when the score hit eight disaster level. Was this another example of health inequality? They weren't told about Richard's condition deteriorating during Friday evening, so Richard was alone. He was called to the ward in the early hours on Saturday. Um, Sheila was called, the family was called, 
and Richard was already dead at that point. Um, a nurse told her several times that she just had to accept that his time had come. Richard was 33 and he died from constipation. At the inquest, an experienced colorectal surgeon said, patients don't die from fecal impaction. Well, Richard did. And as I said, it took five years um, to get an inquest into Richard's death. So that is Richard's story. And I'm sorry, as I said, it was so long. It's harrowing, it's upsetting. I don't want to terrify everyone, but part of me wants to terrify everyone because actually it is something that is still happening and people are still dying from constipation. And there's lots of issues within that story that I think we all as families recognize i know some of my team who've done our working with families training with us will recognize judy's noodles in all of that and one of the exercises that we've done around choice and control um so that's it i'm going to stop talking now because you've heard enough of my voice and i want to kind of ask a few questions i'm just going to remind myself what the questions are and share my screen again just bear with me a second So one of the things that we do know is, uh, I'm going to go back, that some of the literature that's been done and research that's been done around this has, has in the past suggested that learning disability is a cause of constipation. It isn't. Despite higher rates of constipation in people with learning disabilities, it's not a symptom of a learning disability. It's very treatable. It's a very treatable cause of suffering. And there are a variety of pharmacological and non-pharmacological treatment options. And there is a need for a holistic, person-centered approach to manage the constipation. Lots of people suffer with constipation, so quite often it's not taken seriously enough. It is surprising that um, when research has been done, that we, we were hoping to have um, somebody from Dimensions here today who's unfortunately not been able to join us at the last minute. When Dimensions looked at their, um, their data around constipation and people, they found that 95% of the people they support were on laxatives. Um, that's a huge number of people that are taking laxatives, but I guess at least their con constipation has been looked at. Okay, next, I'm gonna stop talking in a minute. I really am, I promise. Um, have lessons been learned from Richard's story? These are the questions we're putting to you. What are we doing differently now that will prevent anyone else going through this situation? And what, will, what can families do? This was a family who was very on it, actually, and knew their stuff and was working originally really closely, but they were fogged off by the learning disability provider. If you've got the concerns, what can we do? One of the things that Sheila said to me in our interview was, don't be complacent. Never be complacent. It's never done. You need to constantly be on it, which saddens me really, but, but that's, that's the case. So I'm going to hand it over to you to questions, um, comments, um, whatever. Anyone? Well, I think from um, that case study, we can... Um clearly see that the Mental Capacity Act was used completely inappropriately in this case because you can't say that somebody who hasn't got capacity can make um, you know, bad choices. If they've got capacity and then they do make bad choices, that's sort of a different scenario. But it, from what um, you've read to us, it seems like he didn't have capacity and was reliant on staff supporting him it's yeah it's really troubling to hear stories like this and, and especially because it's it's not really that long ago is it it's quite distressing that things like this are still happening but I tend to find that um a lot of support workers they not all but a few they don't realize how important it is for um, the people with the learning disability to be encouraged to get up and to do things, do activity, because that's all going to help with the bowels. Um, so whether it's, I mean, I know 
within the COVID situation, things are a bit more tricky with going out. And obviously people with Down syndrome are classed as clinically vulnerable, but they could still maybe do things like hoovering in the house, perhaps a bit of dusting, just to get people up out of their chair. Because quite often you do go into the homes and people are just sat around which is, it's not good for anyone, physical or mental well-being, I don't think. So, yeah, it's, it's things like this. It's, I'm wondering, actually, if the community learning disability team, which I'm part of, whether we actually need to go and do some training in the, just generic training about bowel management in the homes. Because, yeah, I don't want to see stories like this. You know, it does break my heart. It really does. Thank you, Karen. And Simon, you've got your hand up. Yes, I was just going to I, you know, I reiterate what Karen says. And I think, as you said, correct, the, the trouble is constipation is sort of seen as being a minor issue, isn't it? And I think that's that's the difficulty. And I can understand that, the, the you know, if you had a best interest meeting, it, it's not high enough up the agenda for you know, and I could well understand, so, oh, well, it's, you know, invasion of somebody's dignity for them to be monitored when they're in the bathroom. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's that aspect as well. And as you, you know, I mean, again, you and I've had chats about what we also could do to perhaps raise the profile that, that to, to see constipation as a, as a potentially fatal condition, um, unless it's taken more seriously. So, yeah, I think that that's one of the key learning from this, isn't it? Again, I, I can understand, um, like we were saying, Simon, that people do want their privacy when they go to the toilet. But um, I mean, I only sort of last year I was supporting a gentleman with colitis. And so it was really important that staff could look in, into the toilet bowl. So we made an agreement with the client that the client would go in the bathroom, do what he had to do, but not flush it. So that was the agreement. So then the staff would go in mm. and see what was there, check for blood and, you know, diarrhoea. So that's how we got around it in that particular case. Um, but obviously, I, I realise it depends what each individual's like. There's, um, some are more able than others, aren't they, with their understanding. So you may well have to sit in with uh, people that really don't have the understanding and that would flush the loo. It's, it's just um, like... Uh, that was said earlier it's about being person-centered isn't it and talking with the family and the carers and working out a plan together yeah certainly people can always refer to the community learning disability teams we have three in Oxfordshire so we've got uh, the south team the city and the north team up in Banbury so we're, we're always happy to support so if we so so one of the issues with this and 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 a common issue that we hear all the time from families is is that they have is the issue with the provider it's a shame we haven't got yeah. disability providers in this because i think that's where we mm -hmm. get some of this work with staff if you've got a problem with the provider and the, the, you fit you are worried about not having that evidence of um or they're not taking things seriously can families then go to the learning disability team and self-refer and say, look, I'm really yeah, worried. Absolutely. How do they escalate it is my question, I think. Yeah, um, I mean, we always, we will always yeah. take self-referral. So you, absolutely that, yeah, we would be very pleased to, 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 to do that. That's good to know. Thank you. Because I think that's where families come up against a brick wall and get fobbed off with that it's his choice or her mm -hmm. choice to do that. And we've all been there in some ways. Um, Gary, I've had your hand up. Yeah, yeah um, I think I've done it right. Yeah. It, it's, just, it's just a point of, of, obviously, it's not just what's coming out the end, it's what's going on the other end as well. Mm -hmm. um, the diet, if the diet's wrong, then you're going to get constipation problems. Uh, we took on our daughter's care four years ago, and we don't, have a, we don't have any problems anymore. But when she was with a care provider, you know, we went one Christmas day that she's in complete agony. And ended up taking her to hospital at Christmas night, only to pass a bowel movement of 1.2 kilos. Um, she'd been left 16 days. She had a doctor's appointment, which she refused to go to because she's in such pain. Uh, so she, they didn't take her. Uh, we brought her home for Christmas, and then we obviously dealt with it. But um, I just want to point out the fact that it's just not what comes out of the end; it's what's going in. 
and also the turnover of staff because a lot of stuff gets missed when people leave and people go sort of thing that was one of the biggest problems what we had yeah thank you for that Gary um and I think yeah absolutely right I mean there is key things about that that is known for everyone is the good diet exercise drinking lots of fluids um good posture as well as something that comes up a lot sitting people properly on the toilet so their knees are up there's lots of advice and information out there that can be followed I guess for me it's how do you as a parent make sure you know it's actually being followed um, if your child who is now an adult is not living with you um, I noticed that Lisa, Lisa you put a comment in there about uh, about medication as well so some medications can have a, a real um, impact on on people's um, and can cause constipation as well, can't it? Uh, is there any way of counteracting that with balanced diet? Sorry, Angela, you're waving at me. Yeah, so Gail, what it is, is I've got quite a few comments that people have put on the comment, with, and I'm just wondering if I could, they're quite yeah. sort of medical professionally, and I'm just wonder if I could say what they are. So just to give the medical professionals a bit of a minute have a think about it and so parents know their questions are going to get answered is that okay if we do that um but yeah lisa's point about medication was actually on the list as well um, so things that people have talked about are rapid gut transition too many poos um laxido concerned about the long-term impact of that um and um how do you identify um, so identification um, is, is a bit of an issue as well. Um, so somebody's saying, how do you identify, this is Lisa actually, um, uh, um, without x-rays, um, what, what's going on? And that's come up quite a few times that parents are concerned that, that it, is there a, what about the, that there's no definitive way of knowing what the issues are um, and I think what they mean is in terms of um, kind of make, making a, a clinical judgment um, and that e even seems to extend to having or not having an x-ray um, and also um, issues with things like chronic um, colitis and issues from, from birth. So some of these issues around constipation are sort of acquired, if you like, but then some of them are, are things that people are born with does that make sense I've sort of thrown quite a lot of issues there Simon yeah I think Angela I, I mean I would say I mean the key things to to think as has been already said in some way what it's firstly it's what the person's diet looks like it, it that you, you you know we all need a healthy diet and people making bad choice choices the, you, we can all make bad choices some of the time but we we do need to balance that up with um fiber um a, a varied diet so I think you know you can have burger and chips but you also need to eat fruit and you need to have vegetables so it's what goes in that's important I think secondly the sort of basic stuff monitoring someone's bowel movements is absolutely fundamental and and you know if you've got any concerns at all you don't you know that's the step before x-rays is just making sure that most people have a, a bowel movement in the morning um, and, and usually once a day and it, it's I suppose that's the normal but it's equally well other people's normal is it could be different but it's a matter of just recording what if something happens that outside the, the normal and I think the third thing is that and we would certainly do this if someone's behavior changes uh, and that behavior change has been quite rapid then always think there must be a physical cause investigate anything like that and I mean I, we, you know we've talked about the annual health checks but these are just and that's obviously is, is a good backup but that doesn't that's not a substitute for if someone's behavior changes it's almost certainly going to be due to a physical cause rather than a sudden onset of some mental health problem so I would say those are the three key areas to be monitoring I don't know do my colleagues would you add to that yeah, I, I um, would recommend that in each of the homes um, that they have a copy of the Bristol stool chart because that's probably, um, it's, it's if, if you haven't seen it, it's um, it basically, 
it, it has a list of the stools in a pictorial format. So you can tell if somebody's dehydrated, if they need to have more fluid. Um, it, it's just a good thing to give you that initial idea of um, the person that you're supporting about their well-being. Um, but really that needs to be started before uh, somebody does end up with these problems because then you can think, oh yeah, well, that's not looking quite right. So something's going on. So it's, it's good for early indications. But with, with things like colitis, that's um, in a way that's kind of the opposite, isn't it? Because that's when people are going to the toilet a lot, but that also needs monitoring because that information is also really good for the, if, um, the gastroenterologist. They would like to look at that and they'd like to know about things like mucus and blood in the stools. Um, so that's mm. very important, but it, it is about getting the uh, care staff team on board. And some of them, they, well, quite a few of them, as it seems, they, they do need that education. You know, I think- I it's think a, it's the monitoring uh, bit and what is your normal yeah, is. is yeah. The and I literally, my, my daily conversations with Guy's staff team at the moment is, um, has he done a poo? Mm. And what number is it on the Bristol stool? Yeah, but that's Not important. I to still be doing with a 30 year old, but it's, it, they, I mean, you know, it's for me, it's my peace of mind. It's a number five, it's a number four, you know, great, perfect. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think knowing that, that um, mm. you, we can we can share copies of that. We are going to share as much of this information after the event um, with all the guidance, all of the uh, good practice stuff that we've managed to pull together to everyone as well. Um, but yeah, so, thank you for that, Anjali. Yeah, can I just take us back to some of the things? So thank you for some of those answers, but there are things that, that we need to just go back to. So one thing is overspill. Quite a lot of questions about overspill, please. And then can um, this uh, rapid gut transition, please, and the laxido, um, can we can we ask about so long term use of um, uh, I don't know what you call them aids to constipation laxatives. laxatives thank you now this just demonstrates this is not a household in which such things are needed but um, yeah so and I'm sure that's something well I know that's something people when I grew up you were told not to use laxatives because you'd get a lazy bowel that's what I remember being told um, so could we have something and then rapid, rapid gut transitions and overspill. And does the Bristol stool chart have such information on it for things like overspill? <clears throat> I, can I just say something about, uh, it's about, yeah, the overflow diarrhea. I think that's a huge issue because I think sometimes people then think that someone has diarrhea and that it's not. And there is a leaflet um, called Poo Matters that has some really easy to understand information on there. there there's a bowel management plan a basic bowel management plan on there that's really easy to fill in um, and there's also some pictures there that show constipation and it shows um, overflow diarrhea and why that's there so and I think sometimes no matter how much you talk to people about it sometimes they need to see a, you know a, a diagram that clearly shows that because I've had people that have had you know bowel movement every once a big one after four four days followed by really loose stools and then um they've been given um there's someone that lived with a, a family they were given um um the stool hardener afterwards um i can't remember what it's called you know the one you take when you have diarrhea the over-the-counter one the um, they were given yeah they were given modium afterwards to stop because the the family thought that that was um diarrhea and not overflow diarrhea so yeah and the blad bladder and bowel nurses have always said um what normal what would be considered in a normal range would be three times a day um to three times a week but that would be a, a, a number five stool, you know a healthy stall on the bristol stall chart so if it's you know multiple times a day but loose stalls that's not but it's really important to get someone's baseline and what's normal for someone when they're well yeah and i think in making sure that 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 people you know stick to their laxatives when they're prescribed so i've yeah. had some people as well who um some of the, the support staff have been 
up in arms if the person hasn't taken their um stopped their medication and haven't taken like the risperidone haven't taken the laxatives but for this you know particular person the you know that the laxatives is the thing that actually makes the biggest impact because the constipation can lead to so you know I think and the other thing Tracy is about physical movement isn't it that I think we all assume that food moves around our gut by gravity and that's partly true but it's it also unless you're walking around those muscles that move the uh, things through the gut don't work you've got to be physically moving to keep your bowels in good shape yeah and a a good starting point is that um poo matters leaflet it's really um really helpful there's some really good information on there i think if somebody has got problems with their bowels they'd need a more detailed bowel management plan but it's a good start and i think that is it has good reminders on there for staff as well so I, we had some comments around the, the, the continuing use of it. Does it stop the bowel working and all of that? And that's definitely something I was told years ago when Guy was on lactulose for a while. Um, I've heard since then that that's not true and that actually it's much better to take a daily dose of a laxative. And he, he takes a daily sachet of laxido now. As part of it's not it's not just PRN and that is actually better. Can you confirm that is is the? I think the you want if you're taking any form of medication and that's what you're effectively talking about, then you need to be doing it under the guidance of your GP. Yeah. And I think that's the critical thing. So uh, there isn't a blanket rule. It has to be it's a medication. You you know and ideally you're not taking any medication for a, a length of time. If you the steps we were talking before about diet movement and bowel monitoring those are the, the key ones and it's only if those don't work that you know, need to think about other steps great lovely any other comments from anyone vicky hi right thank you um my daughter had a very complicated birth um, and she also had necrotizing enteritis, which has been, um, you know, which is where part of her bowel died. And I was looking at Richard's when you were reading that out, which I kind of rang a, rang a bit of a bell for me. But anyway, she has got very complex epilepsy and takes a lot of medication for the epilepsy, which in turn, I believe, I understand, probably does result in her um, constipation, which is, it's been, it's been a horrendous problem for all of her life. Um, tried to address this, I think we finally got on top of it. Um, but what does surprise me is that, well, a couple of years ago, she was walking very badly, I'd gone to visit her. And, um, and I said, what's wrong? Have you hurt your back or something? She said, no, she said, I, I can't do a poo. <laughs> and. I thought, my God, you know, there's everything in her notes. The girl that was supporting her was training to be a midwife. And I thought, you know, she just hasn't got this. How can that be? So you're right, you do have to be on it. And um, anyway, we've sorted that out, but it is something I I do constantly check. Um, But of course, the problem is if she does get constipated, then she's more likely to have a seizure. And there's a real lack of knowledge a real lack of knowledge out there uh, for people with epilepsy. There's also a really big lack of knowledge when staff, support staff are employed to have a good idea, despite all the training that they do online, they, they very rarely have a good idea of diet. Hannah has a portion control plate and one young lady said, oh, I've never seen one of those. She had no idea. And, and it really, it does stop with the providers or however their training is given in, in good nutrition and that they know how to cook and that they encourage that person to exercise. Because I've um, my daughter's been in supported living for a few years and I've seen some terrible food. I saw one guy when he came in to support a young man um, actually microwave a salad. I've seen another person given cold baked beans because the support staff did not know, did not know how to cook them. And I just think that's that's a terrible way to treat our guys, you know? As parents, you really do have to be on top of it. But then, you know, if these people come in and they have a job and they're just not being trained, they don't understand nutrition, 
going to, I mean, one place where my daughter lived, they boiled chicken, boiled chicken for about an hour. <laughs> I was like, all the nutrition in that meat had gone. Yeah, it, it is, um, it's, it's something that needs a really big shake up, a really big shake up. I think. And I think that, that, that for us is obviously one of the things that we do with our working with families training is, is, is talk about that sort of stuff in line with the mental capacity act and all of those things and and my discussion with sheila handley was literally around that how you uh become the difficult parent going to the support staff the s support staff getting upset because you've challenged them on their cooking ability um you suggest i mean i've suggested things like um i've got guy a smoothie maker for Christmas so they can chuck in linseed and flax seed and all of those sort of things so so giving him all this healthy stuff through a smoothie um and uh just trying to get them to use that and things so there's little things that you can do but but you don't want to be that parent that is being difficult and and it's very easy to become that parent um, and that's that's I think that is, is is kind of what happens. So we need to do some work with the providers on this as well. What training are the staff having? Um, I know when I worked for Dimensions, one of the things we talked about is doing a kind of family cookbook and what families uh, like special meals and things, just to introduce that idea that we can be part of the team and provide that support. But yeah, it's it's a tricky. We 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 tread a very tricky line don't we when it comes to to that um so any other comments from anyone before we kind of move on a little bit jessica hi um we talked a lot about monitoring um people when they go to the toilet um and i'm just wondering if um the learning disability team have got any suggestions about how to do that um, so my daughter, she quite likes going to the toilet and she quite likes spending a lot of time on the loo. Um, but she is able to flush the loo herself. Um, and also what she really likes about going to the loo is uh, taking off a little piece of loo roll and rolling it into a little ball and then popping it into the loo. Um, and that meets some of her sensory needs. Um, and she finds it quite relaxing. But obviously that makes it quite tricky to see what has gone into the loo. Um, so I'm just wondering about the sort of extent to which we need to monitor it and, and sort of practical tips. Thank you. I think, so I pick that one up again. I think the thing, my suggestion would be with, with anything like that. I mean, if somebody is getting enjoyment from activities like that, then we certainly, <laughs> we don't want to cramp those. So what I would suggest is to look at ways of trying to build in some sort of routine that also enables you to, to have a look at what's going on but without detracting from her um, getting sensory pleasure from doing it. So, but to build that in and again, to perhaps have, you know, for her to be part of that process that, you know, will you'll, we'll stand up and take a photograph or, I know it sounds a bit bizarre, but I mean, you know what I mean? To, to make it a fun part of this, all of the same process. Um, and then you, you, you can build it in, you can keep the person safe, but also for them to still enjoy their activities. I don't know whether my colleagues would got any other suggestions. Yeah, well, then, um, you could put the little bits of rolled up paper in a bin. I don't know if 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 she would agree to that. It's it's sort of trial and error with things like that, isn't it? It's um it's just trying things out, seeing what happens, and reevaluate again. So it yeah, it might take a a bit of time to find the right way for her, but um. Yeah, it's it's combining the two, isn't it? That uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're on mute, Gail. Adrienne, you've got your hand up. You need to unmute. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Adrienne, and I take care of. Um, my sister-in-law and I recently became a carer as well. And what I find is how many people back off from talking about 
something which happens naturally for them every single day. And that is where my I... Hand, oh, my, my hand up's gone. Hello. So that, that's where um, my biggest issue lies. Um, what you had to say about the youngster back in 2012, 13, really, really resonated with me because back in 2013, before I went into hospital, I had my worst experience of constipation to the point that I had to agree with one of the other gentlemen that said we needed to use some sort of stick to actually help me get it out. It was just too complex um, and badly done. And later on, um, I saw one of the spool charts in the toilet. Would Oxford and other carers actually make it almost mandatory to have such pictures within the toilet? Because then people like my sister-in-law, who's been in care and she's 61 years now, basically all her life, would actually be able to say for themselves, I've had a bad one. This is what it looked like when I looked down down, down the toilet. So that's really important. The other biggest issue I wanted to add on top of that was the doctors, the people taking care, simply not listening. Um, and that's where the heart of the issue lies, is people are not prepared to talk about it. And I'm very glad that we are talking about it today. It's so important. And the one comment I put on the chat was, I heard only the other day, all we actually need is 30 grams of fiber. So a dollop of um, uh, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, sesame seeds, golden flax seeds, and it's worked for me. That's all. Thank you. Had a couple of people with hands up and I'm trying to find them now. Does anyone else want to comment? Okay. No. Can I just say it's it's a bit um, with GPs with accessing GPs sometimes that can be it's very variable. Um, it can be really difficult. I mean, I've I've su I supported someone on a very long journey with constipation was still not through the journey um but had multiple you know this is me going as a nurse going to a gp appointment face to face with somebody um repeated times and at, at one time i i was told it'll just come out when it's ready and it it, it just that it yeah it can be really difficult and i i, I found that a really difficult process and whenever anything like that happens that I find really difficult when I'm with somebody I think how are people supposed to manage this themselves how are families supposed to manage it um yeah so it can be really really, and I guess, really I guess, tricky I guess the issue as well is 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 what awareness has been raised for people who are managing their own um, bowel habits who are going to the toilet who don't have parents or um, or care staff or support staff um, who need to help them with their with their personal care. I mean, people on their own. Do they? Is is there? So so for me, this is a, the start of a whole awareness raising that we need to keep raising awareness because because the point is people are still dying from this and it's the twenty first century and they really shouldn't be. It is avoidable. Um, we can do things. The, the biggest issue for me in, in Sheila's story and the most upsetting thing for me is the fact that all the information that the family had about Richard, all the information, all those notes, all that, all that stuff about his past history was wiped and ignored by new people without any consultation. One of the things that Sheila said was, was the fact that um, she wasn't involved in the care planning process. So when, when the care plan was changed, her knowledge of Richard and all that history wasn't included in his new care plan because she wasn't involved. That's the crux of all this for me, is the working together in partnership, involving people who know the person best. 
whether that is a parent or for some people it might not be it might be um it might be other relative or it might be support staff who've supported that person for years and years if they've been in supportive living or residential care for a long time it's making sure that we keep those that we lose some of that um difficult parent stuff that actually you're all in it together and you all want to learn together so so do we do next is there something that we because i am keen that this isn't just a talking shop i think uh, those of you that have been to our events before where we, we try to do something as a result of what we've heard what do we need to do next let's have your ideas um, to shape what we what we do next as a, as a charity gary You're muted, Gary. Gary, you're still muted. Okay, he's still on mute. Okay, he seems to have disappeared. He's raised his hand and now he's gone. Are you still, are you there? Hello, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, I was just thinking more along the line of video care plans rather than written care plans. Um, I, no, I understand through Free experience that you've had different nationalities of people that work for work for my daughter, mm -hmm. and then maybe their ability to understand or read it isn't great. And it, with something that's video, then you could have a video of a parent or a mm -hmm. carer actually saying, talking about their person and what their troubles and problems are. Maybe that wouldn't get sort of thrown in one bin, thrown in a bin, and replaced with something else. So we have done some work around um, having person-centered plans on a multi-me uh, Wix wiki uh, platform that we did a couple of years ago and that is certainly some of our families are using that um and that is you know the the visuals is helpful isn't it you know what would a normal what does what's normal what would normal look like but yeah i agree anything anything that is that works best for the person i think is the that being person-centered stuff is the key um anyone else angeli Um, yeah, so one of the things I'm going to do as a parent is to print out the Bristol stool chart and stick it on the back of our toilet door, which I know will cause great hilarity. But uh, we um, we don't we're not bashful in our house um, about those things. You can't be bashful with fear. So that's one of the things. So I think with OXFSM we can encourage our parents to print out the Bristol stool chart and have a think about that. Um, I um, the other thing is I'm updating Theo's education, health and care plan section A in the all about me section. Um, and I'm going to think quite hard because we manage his diet very well. He has an enormous amount of exercise. He has no medication. He's in the best possible place. And I realise listening to this, that it is no accident that he doesn't have problems with his bowels. So I would urge any parent now who's got a child at school um, or with an EHCP plan, if you haven't been to your annual review recently, get the EHCP plan out, have a look at it and make sure in the health section and in the all about me section, you have got something where you set out um, what the dietary exercise medical needs are and how you manage any bowel problems that are in there and what your young person needs in order for that to work and if you realize you don't know and you haven't got that information then reach out to us and we can help you to get that and that includes things like putting the Bristol stool chart up and I think there's also a conversation my third thing is a conversation for me about um, with my son about what what is a normal poo and and what that looks like because he has the capacity to understand that I get that people not everybody is in that position here but everybody knows their family member incredibly well and even if their family member is not using words to communicate as Simon says behavioral change uh, which is really interesting for me is is likely to be a physical thing rather than a, a, a mental health thing that's a really good take home. I think the other thing as well is that, you know, most of our um, children are having, or young adults are having annual health checks and maybe raise that when we go along to the annual health check with our local GP, not only just to, to check in with them, but also if we're having GPs who aren't taking this maybe as seriously as they should, just making sure that they're 
uh, aware that we're on it as family carers um, and that actually it's something that we want to be included just to, to have that conversation with them about, you know, are they regular and, and all those kind of questions that we don't always want to ask, but should be asking and maybe have that, you know, if you've got if you've got um, uh, your child is with a support provider and they are the ones that are doing the annual health check because that does happen. Make sure that they're also raising those questions on, on your child's behalf. Yeah, thank you. Tracy. Um, just about the annual health checks, I don't know if anybody's aware there is a pre-annual health check questionnaire um, that's available, which would be really helpful. So there is an easy read version, but there's also one, a version that's not easy read. So I share that with everybody every single time because it's a way, even if, if um, somebody lives in supported living, you could add your comments on there and it has it covers every area of physical health. And so... It, that could then go along if, if they're being supported to attend the annual health check that could then go along so I think they're really great because everybody if someone lives in supported living it could be left out for everybody to be able to fill in um, so that it's not just up to the one person that supports that one appointment and it just does encourage a very holistic conversation with the GP so I mean I can send a link um, to that who shall I send that to, to? me uh, if you send it to me, Tracy, okay. on... oh, you've frozen, Simon. Sorry. Oh, he was just about to say something to you there, Tracy. I could say it's on yeah. our website as well. Is it what the annual health check questionnaire? You can download it from the website. Oh, okay, it's on our Oxford Health website. So if you okay. maybe if you could just send whichever link to me and then I'll make sure it's yeah. included in the notes that go out after this. Will you so will you send that, Simon? Yes, they they're fabulous things. So <laughs> we've collated quite a few resources. We don't you know we are going to yeah. bombard you with stuff about poo now. Um, but 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 it, we just think then you can decide which bit. Some people like loads of information. Other people only like little bits of easy read. But it, it's up to you. But we will send it to you anyway. Um, I'm conscious that we've also got a couple of parents here, and I hope you don't mind, they don't mind me pulling them out if they're still here, that have children who are adults and some who are still children who who have um, who are tube fed and have there's other issues around. Yeah, Kath, because I know when we talked about doing this event, you wanted to you wanted to sort of mention something about some of the issues that you might have with with H. Just that um, I think all the points that have already been made about good diet and fluids and exercise and movement and posture apply across the piece, whether or not your um, young person is wearing pads 24 seven um, or whether they're able to use the toilet. Um, it, it, it's sort of the monitoring of what goes in and what comes out. And I think sometimes that we've de I think we've definitely had more issues with um, H having constipation since he's been at college and I think that's probably because of um, you know people come and go on different shifts and stuff and maintaining that thread but the the reassuring point is there is that they are monitoring what goes in and out it's just that I think they need to sometimes double check um, maybe on a weekly basis that it is enough coming out um, because we found with the blended diet that has slowed down his gut function, that he's improved his reflux, but it does slow his gut function down. Um, and I think we do need to look at his um, the, the constipation issues and getting this daily sachet of Laxido onto his annual health check via the GP and follow that up as a result of today. But yeah, we have this, the blended diet has been great in so many ways, but it has caused more constipation issues. And yeah, we need to be prepared to talk about it. I think a lot of people try not to. Yes, thanks for that, Kath. Anyone else want to add to that bit of the discussion? I just wondered if the physiotherapy is involved in that particular case. Um, is there a, a wheelchair point. bound? Or? Yeah, he uses a wheelchair 24-7. Um, he can uh, wait there with uh, his walker. And, um, he, you know, when we had issues in the first lockdown last March, we had to get him pedalling his tricycle in our small garden just to try and get movement going. Mm -hmm. But I think I also had this sort of feeling that 
if he was backed up, I should ease off on his feeds. And we spoke to a friend who's a retired GP and he said, no, keep going with putting fiber in and the exercise and the massage. And eventually we got things going again. But um, it's always quite um, stressful for us managing it on his behalf. Um, and yeah, the, the idea on the seeds is quite a good one. But one of the things this GP friend suggested was um, peas, blending peas and putting, the, you know, keeping vegetables going um, to help keep things moving. But, you know, the physio input is a good idea. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Simon Jones. Just a quick No, you've frozen again, Simon. In their bowels. Sorry, can you say that again? You froze out a little bit halfway through. Okay, yeah, no, sorry. I'm just saying I used to be a volunteer riding for the disabled, and that was, uh, the physio said that was a really good way of helping people's yeah. bowel movements. Uh, yeah, it would, yeah. it would, it would mind if you stuck me on a horse, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, H was too disabled for the group we found six years ago, so that didn't end well. Yeah. Oh, what a shame. Um, so, so lots of information. Um, lots of things. We've, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm keen to do a kind of exit poll, but um, I, I, again, keen to, to have some ideas about how we take this forward. It, it can, a bit of a, a kind of hands up poll. Is this something? That you think is is would be good for an awareness raising campaign that Box FSN can do. So if, if you do, then please wave at me and don't. Yeah. Okay, so that's good. Good. We're getting lots of um, lots of wavy hands then. So that's something we'll look at. We'll work with Simon and Steph and others about. And and I think definitely the learning disability support providers. Anjali, hands up. Yes, I'm just wondering whether parents who've taken part in today would be willing to share some of their stories and wisdom and experience because um, in the chat we've had some fantastic, really practical suggestions, you know, one um, parent trying one kind of laxative that didn't work for many years and then suddenly thinking, actually, do you know what, we could try something else and that, but there are some just very practical stories here and I would be, um, much as I absolutely adore a man or a woman in a white coat uh, with a stethoscope, I do actually think um, it would be much more useful to have some very practical parent stories. And we've got the full range here, all ages, tube fed, people, little ones who have been born with issues to big ones who have acquired them over the years. So if, if people would be up for that, could you just let me know in the chat, if you just give me a name, then um, I'll come back to you and, and follow up at a point where we, we feel that could be helpful. Because I mean, frankly, what makes these conversations is you. Uh, so, um, and, uh, and you know, there is no substitute for all those hours you've put in in the bathroom. Uh, so thank you. Yes. I was just going to say, actually, if, if anybody did have stories that they wanted to share or tips, I mean, just email us and we can just put together a quick, um, you know, top tips from parents to share with others, which um, then we can send that out with this um, whole thing, which might be a good way of being able to get it um, sent out to everybody. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea to me. Great. Lovely. I'm going to launch another poll now because we've got uh, about 10 minutes left and I don't um, unless there's anything else, anyone's got any burning comments or anything they want to say before we, we start to close down. I'm looking across the screens. Great. Um, I just um, wanted to ask, is everybody aware how to make referrals to the learning disability teams? Because I, I think that's one thing maybe we can share if you're not, because I think it's really important if you just if if you have any questions please make referral please do i think that's it, a really important thing yeah. for me to, if you if you get stuck el elsewhere that you can actually refer in yourself to the learning disability teams i think that's a really yeah. useful thing for families and, and yeah and put on the referral because we have screening so whoever um w there's someone that screens all the new we're on a duty rotor for screening new referrals that come through each day um so if, if you are making a referral to the team, um, just put on there that you've attended <laughs> attended an event and been advised to make a referral from the nursing team. 
um and yeah be 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 feel free to stick our names on there then people can come through to us so yes lovely thank you very much anything else before we close down if you think about anything after just do get in touch with us um as i say we're open to any other suggestions or any sort of further discussions i'm just glad we've finished slightly early but um i'm going to just do this poll now um i say i'm going to launch it i can't find my poll I was me. Kathy, can you see the other poll that we did or is it? There we go. No. Um, no, that's not working. I'm sorry. Best laid plans and all of that. Um, Oh, there it is. No, actually, I've I done it for you, Gail. Thank you. <laughs> oh, technically challenged a lot. Um, will you be sharing, uh, do you have a, a, a link to what, Simon, how can we share our referral, t referral forms? Um, oh, you're muted. Oh, you're unmuted. Steph. I will send a, a blank referral form to Cathy as well. Yeah, because we have three different teams, so it would just be for the different locality. Yeah, thank That's you. Great. That's really helpful, thank you. And just to say, um, again, thank you for, um, for all the professionals that have come on and, and, and supported us with this event and uh, we'll definitely be in touch with you in the future. Thank you um, to everyone else um, for your input. As Anjali said, this, uh, this doesn't, none of this works without you um, joining us. Um, just finishing off this poll and then, and then we will close. We are looking at other events like this so if you have any other burning issues or things you want us to cover please get in touch it looks like we're going to be doing zoom for the foreseeable future um it is something we'll probably carry on doing because it's quite convenient anyway um even when we can get back together so uh do get if there's anything you want us to be doing please get into um we will do that. Um, Hey, hey, Gail, have we yeah. recorded? Have we recorded this session? I've got somebody asking. We have. It will be in the. Uh, it'll be on our YouTube channel. Okay. We'll send you the link to it once it's uploaded. That's great. Thanks very much. Yeah. Great. That's everyone. Thank you very much. Um, and that's great to see that. Um, that people learnt something new and you found it helpful. So that's um, right. Thank you very much. That's all. That's all from us. Um, thank you. See you. Again soon, and um, take care. And I hope the lockdown continues to be as stress free as. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. Jules, if you can hang on for a bit, that'd be great. Thank you.
Okay, is everyone? We've still got a few people here. Sam, you're welcome to stay as well. Angela, just gonna have a debrief. Uh, hi, I'm here. Um, <laughs> Angela, that was fantastic. That was so good. I said to Angela, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to run off. And um, yeah, I've got three minutes and I will have to go. <laughs> but I just wanted to keep listening. Just brilliant. Okay. Glad you found it leave it on just so I can listen. Glad you found it helpful. I've just, I've got Adrienne still on and I'm not sure. I'm just going to move her trying to but it's not working okay for some reason okay there we go there you go okay um oh, don't want to report you sorry don't want don't report uh, jules i've got a quick question i'm trying to save the chat um, yeah i'm trying to save it into google drive and it keeps coming up to google drive but it's not it doesn't kind of show me how it's saving or whatever so I would I would save the chat and then go into your Google Drive and then click upload. Ooh. <laughs> oh I did, I did in the settings check make sure that it is it, it does save them. So I don't know how that that works. I've got save chat, but I'm trying to and then it's got it's got the three little dots and it says save chat, which I've done. Yeah. And then go into uh, when you click save chat, it's, it should um say something like show in finder or show in um so you can see where it's been saved uh that doesn't do that on mine it says save chat which i've done and then next to it has got file and that, uh, that's uh, the file. so i'm clicking so i i would i would literally i would save the chat yeah and then um or i've saved it so i could email it to you yeah you'll have it as a file yeah yeah, because I'm just, but it should be, I mean, it should save up to Google Drive. because It would should, be, yeah. yeah. The it, way that I find it, Kathy, is I go into File, and then yeah. I go to um, Recent, and then usually it's at the top. Yeah, it's not actually, um, it's not coming so up. Go, yeah, yeah, if you go to Recent, Downloads. No, I haven't got that. Up or documents, it usually is in there somewhere if you do a little search. Yeah, I've got, um, well, I'll have a look. Anyway, as long as school, uh, Jules has got it, that's the main thing. I hate yeah, this stuff, that's, it drives me really, mental. Really good points in there, and there's, it's a shame not to kind of capture that, isn't it? We have oh, to start still recording, by the way, though. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>